Feng, CEO, co-founder of Infer. And we started our company about three years ago. And our background going to this, which kind of explains kind of what we're doing today, is my two co-founders and I, we were working at Google. Uh, and we were working on a bunch of data science that was you know, underpinning things like Google Web Search to try to improve web search relevance and ranking, uh, to improve click-through rates on the uh, advertising platform. And we were just enamored by what great advances we can make with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and, and large-scale data infrastructure. And so we thought, you know, instead of trying to push the needle even more in the consumer space and try to fight for that half a percent improvement or, you know, trying to improve, uh, you know, the Facebook news feed to tell you that, you know, uh, your friend is doing something across the street. Why, why don't we take that technology and apply it to a greenfield opportunity, uh, an opportunity that uh, isn't using uh, machine learning and, and data science to kind of uh, to improve its decision making. And we thought, you know, what better space to do it in than in the enterprise space where we pretty much know that, you know, most decision making is not based on data. And when we surveyed the space, there was a, a variety of platforms, like there were, you know, Hadoop and BI infrastructure analytics tools, but they were catered towards solving a large scale number of problems. They're more kind of horizontal infrastructure. And what we felt was important was to build applications, uh, just like we did at Google, that solved specific targeted problems. And, uh, and so we looked at the functions within, within the company, and we decided to focus on sales and marketing, because applications require focus. And, and there's a couple reasons. One was, in the area of sales and marketing, uh, you have uh, data that, if you can move the needle on, can drive revenue, right? So, uh, uh, and the other part of it is that in the sales and marketing world, the data is actually available now uh, compared to you know, many years ago or in other functions of the enterprise. Most companies are using cloud systems like Salesforce, Marketo, Eloqua, which means that this, this data uh, about their sales and marketing systems are online for the first time. So we decided to, uh, to look at that data and we, uh, to see what kind of things we can predict from this data. And uh, we found that we can predict very accurately uh, which potential customers or leads uh, will become paying customers. And so, uh, and we did this with, you know, a lot of great data science, but we also did this by applying large amounts of external data. Uh, so when a lead comes into your web form, like let's say you're one of our customers like Tableau, uh, someone comes in, registers for the product, uh, and uh, they may only provide an email address and a name. And that's not much information to know if someone's going to be a, 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 someone's going to buy your product. So we actually go and we crawl a large amounts of external data and stitch that together, things like industry, revenue, company size, you know, do they have a social presence, to, you know, what's the job history like at that lead, are they hiring people in certain departments, uh, anything that can give us an idea of whether that, that potential customer is likely to buy. And using both external data and their, and their existing sales and marketing data from the customer, we can accurately predict who's going to buy your product. And so we started to release this with customers. We released this with Box and Zendesk. And you know, in the case of Box, we had more than doubled their conversion rate over their largest pool of leads. So they were obviously very happy. And uh, we signed a long-term deal with them. And then Zendesk heard about us. And we did similar results with them. And they signed a three-year deal with us. And it just kept going. And by the end of the, this was in 2012, we had companies, public and private, like Tableau, to Box, to Zendesk, uh, and many others using our product you know, getting pretty significant lift in the conversion rates. And our team was three people. Uh, we were in stealth mode. Uh, we didn't have anyone in sales. And uh, our company name was Party on Data. So everything was pretty much against us. And yet people were, you know, lining up to use our service. So we decided to expand on this. So last year, we raised $10 million. We renamed the company to Infer. And we've been growing ever since. We've been doubling our customer base and our revenue bookings uh, quarter over quarter. Uh, this past quarter, we increased it by 60%. So just a lot of great growth in, in the space. Um, in the case of Tableau, uh, what we specifically accomplished for them, just to take one of the customers, um, across the board, all our customers to date have seen lifts of anywhere between 100% to 200% increases in their conversion rate using our, tech, our predictive technology. In the case of Tableau, they saw an increase in 5.6x in their conversion rate. And, uh, and, so they, and, and the other thing we noticed with them, too, is that they, uh, they were able to there's this notion of a marketing qualified lead, you know, what leads you pass to sales, and they were able to increase the number of leads that they could pass to sales, better leads, by 10%, uh, which doesn't sound like much, except at Tableau's volume, that's worth millions of dollars to them, and uh, they were able to capture that in a very short period of time. So the ROI is very clear, um, and, and we feel pretty good about our ability to kind of move the needle around our technology. And I think this speaks, about, speaks to the industry at large. 
the, if you look at the sales uh, and marketing automation space, you know, the guys like Salesforce, Marketo, and Eloqua, what they have essentially done is they've taken systems like CRM systems and they put them in the cloud. Uh, but these systems are still bookkeeping systems. They're systems that record what's going on with your sales uh, and, and marketing as opposed to really taking action on that data to try to move the needle. These questions, they don't answer questions things like, uh, they don't answer questions like what leads you should be focusing on or which customers are going to churn or which customers you should upsell to. And this is the advantage and the opportunity for predictive technologies like ours to be able to help drive revenue based on all this great data you've been collecting. And there's, we believe there's so much more you could do with this data beyond just bookkeeping it and using it to determine how much revenue you're making per quarter. You can use it to drive your revenue. Um, another advantage to our solution versus even, you know, we work complementary. Uh, we work in lockstep with marketing automation and sales automation systems. Um, but you don't have to have a sales automation system or marketing automation system. We can also work with data that comes into us in some specified format. Um, but that's kind of more implementation details. But the nice thing is if you compare kind of the value we provide to uh, sales and marketers, uh, they can capture the value very quickly. Um, you know, if you're implementing a Salesforce system or a marketing automation system, it could take you six months, 12 months to, you know, to do the migration to get everything set up. For us, our customers are implementing and getting infer up and running in a matter of days, uh, many times next day, uh, which is huge. And so it gives us opportunities to be able to deploy and de-risk things for the customer while getting a lot of value from our system, uh, which is nice because we're not trying to replace your data store. Um, the way the, the, the specifics work is kind of like the life of a customer. Um, it's pretty simple, and it's fairly simpler, similar to how you would run, with, run an Eloqua or Marketo, Marketo system. Um, uh, if you have a CRM system like Salesforce, uh, you give us a seat uh, into your Salesforce system, so like a login, and then Infer will take that and then sync the data, all the historical data that's sitting there, you know, all the leads that you closed and won, all the customers that you closed and lost um, or didn't win with, and we use that as training data for our model and we also go and crawl the web and get a whole bunch of other data about those leads. And then we produce this very accurate predictive uh, scoring engine. And then we, then we push the predictions back into the CRM system and the marketing automation system. We append the predictions to every lead or every account or every contact telling you, hey, this lead's gonna buy your product or this lead's not gonna buy your product. So the nice thing about this is it doesn't require behavior changes on the customer side. We're not forcing uh, sales reps or VPs of sales or VP of marketing to go log into a new experience, have to remember a new password or anything like that. We're going back to the existing workflows that they already use. But uh, where we can provide value, where people come into infra.com, is we can provide dashboards and really stunning visualizations uh, built around our predictions. Uh, so that's, that's how it works, but that's how we've also been able to do it very quickly and easily with our customers. Uh, we'll just go through some of this stuff. Um, so go to market side. Uh, so how are we getting this to customers? Um, uh, first, um, we decided initially to focus on a particular type of buyer. Uh, we decided to focus on mid-market companies. And our definition of mid-market, because that varies uh, across different companies, is you know, anywhere between 50 to 1,000 employees. And these are companies who are B2B companies mostly, um, and also companies that have sales or marketing automation systems. And uh, we have also focused on companies who are in North America. And so, uh, and the typical title is a VP of demand gen, a VP of marketing, a VP of sales, um, or a director of sales ops. Those are typical titles for us. We can sell into both sales and marketing, but we don't need to sell both of them at the same time. We find it's actually advantageous because we can sell into marketing and then sales wants it so bad because they want better leads and they push marketing to force it and vice versa. You know, marketing wants it because they want to be showing sales that they're getting good leads passed into the pipeline. So it's kind of a win-win situation for us. Um, and the reason why we decided to focus on this part of the market is uh, for a few things. One is the top of the market, like the big, big guys like Walmart, um, we were concerned that if we focus on them, we would just get caught in integration hell and just become consultants and employees for the company. Um, and uh, you need a certain amount of support and infrastructure going into those big deals. And we really wanted to focus on repeatability. And we felt that uh, uh, in order to do that, we would need to work with companies where the sales cycles are faster, they are nimble, but they still had enough data volume to be able to build our models. And so mid-market felt like a nice, a nice focus for us. And if you go to the bottom part of the market where you have like the small, small companies, uh, like sub-10 employees, we were just concerned because maybe the data is not enough there, and you just have high variance and churn within those companies. Uh, it ended up being a very good bet for us in a similar uh, sense of if you look at Marketo and Salesforce, they also did it the same way. 
You know, they basically went down 101 and started closing deals, and they started closing deals with mid-market companies. And over time, you now see companies like Salesforce and Marketo closing guys like Allstate Farm and you know, Allstate Insurance and everything else, but they weren't going after those guys in the beginning. And we believe that's the right path to getting our solution to thousands of companies. You know, get the repeatability and get the leverage of a lot of companies using your product and getting value, and then use that to go up market and convince the bigger guys who are going to be slower to adopt it in your way versus you know, bending backwards for them to make it work. Um, in terms of tactics, um, our sales process is pretty simple. Um, the nice thing about our solution in the beginning, to be honest, because it was predictive, it was a fairly new, uh, a new thing for sales and marketers to understand. Uh, most sales and marketers weren't using predictive technology for driving their sales and marketing plan. And so it was kind of like a science fiction term. And we were kind of the early ones treading the water. Uh, but once you start getting folks like Tableau and Box and Zendesk getting considerable lift with their product, uh, there's a... It's like, a, it's like a fashion thing that just goes wild and people want to follow suit and become the, the next gen money ball marketer and salesperson. And we can make them look like heroes around our product. And so um, our sales pitch is like 10 minutes. It's literally show them a slide with all our logos, show them the value, show them the lift. And the fact that you can deploy in days, it's, it's pretty minimal risk. The other thing that we added to it is uh, a 30-day free trial, which de-risk it even further. So uh, you don't pay for it unless there's lift, if you see lift in the trial. Um, and that's worked out really well for us. We've had 100% conversion rate off of trials. Um, and that's decreased the sales cycle by 50% for us when we introduced that. Um, and so uh, going forward, we're going to be deploying a version of our product that will be uh, more self-service. And this will allow us to get into a lot of companies. Right now, we you know, require someone to give us a seat and we do that through a touch. Um, but we feel we can put this on infer.com. Someone can come in and click sign up. And we think that's going to really allow us to grow even faster. So uh, thank you very much. Do you guys have any, any one, I can take one quick question. Can you tell us a little bit more about your uh, business model? So, um, so our business model on the uh, pricing side, it's very similar to um, how Marketo kind of prices out um, their solution. So it's a SaaS agreement. Um, we look at two variables. We look at volume of records and connectors, which systems you want the predictions to be pushed into. Salesforce, Marketo, Eloqua, do you need a REST API? Based on those two inputs, it outputs uh, a price. And we have about three tiers. Um, the nice thing is our pricing has been pretty comparable to how much people are spending on Salesforce and Marketo today. So we've been able to um, speak to the value uh, pretty clearly, but um, the variables that go into the price is pretty similar, so there's, pretty, there's not that much friction on the, on the pricing side. But we're typically signing 90, 30 day trials, and then um, if they back out, then there's no charge in them, but if they continue with it, then they roll into the annual contract. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. How much effort does it require to onboard a new customer? Yeah, good question. Uh, first customer that we brought on board took us like three months. Uh, but at the same time, it was also because we didn't know that much about sales and marketing, so we were kind of using it as an excuse yeah. to learn about sales and marketing. Um, and we just got better and better with every customer. First customer was three months, next customer was a month, next customer was a week, next customer was a day. Um, and we built some infrastructure internally called Keystone, where we literally can take a login from the CRM system, plug it in, and we'll crank and build the entire model on its own, stitch all the external data, evaluate the model, as well as push the predictions back to the customer. So we've been able to bring that turnaround time dramatically down. And if you compare it to even like a Salesforce or Marketo install today, they still have a lot of friction to be able to get their system up and running. You have a lot of data migration issues. You have to get training involved. Um, we don't have training with our stuff. Um, we, we can push directly without having to touch too much. So we brought that down a lot. That's why we want to go to the self-service side pretty soon. Thank you. Judges, if I can ask you to input your scores. And while you guys do that, I want to invite our next presenter up to the stage. Um, do we have Nat Kosick here from BitGlass? So BitGlass, as, a, as a, the title slide says, is in the business of securing corporate data. Um, and I'll tell you more about what that means in a moment. So the problem we solve is like so, uh, as the previous speakers spoke about a whole host of cloud applications, uh, as companies adopt cloud and mobile, the data leaves their building, so to speak. So now your data is out and about everywhere. Everything looks great, the business is growing like crazy, but you no longer have any idea of where your data is. And the larger the company, the more you worry about this, uh, partly because there are regulatory forces and partly because you do really worry about it because your data is valuable. 
So some of the things that uh, our customers worry about is who's downloading my data and is that an audit trail? And the answer is usually no because your data goes from Salesforce through at and cellular network through some device that somebody else owns and so there is no audit trail. And that can be a problem if you're a public company. Uh, another thing that people worry about is um, somebody hacked Salesforce or somebody hacked some other cloud application and now my data is exposed and what does that mean to me? Uh, a third problem is fairly uh, common and something that uh, IT people worry about a lot, which is a tablet or a phone left behind on a cab uh, or any other uh, bar stool for that matter. And often these devices end up containing a lot of corporate data and now you're faced with the issue of having to wipe it or even audit it to see what's on it in the first place. And the uh, fourth problem, and these are uh, the top four problems we encounter, uh, is there's somebody sharing a corporate uh, file on, I would say, Dropbox, for example, or Box, or any other uh, file sharing application. And then it shows up Monday morning and your data is now exposed and you have to uh, answer the question of who done it, right? So these are common questions we see. Uh, the old approach, which is pretty much what most companies have, is to secure the infrastructure. They have locked everything down, networks, phones, laptops, uh, stuck uh, firewalls, proxies, uh, agents on every phone. How many of you carry phones with agents from your employer? Uh, there are many people who carry two phones because they don't want their employees spying on uh, their personal phone calls. Uh, in most companies, approximately 40% uh, of people end up carrying two phones. And what this does to the company is that the, your mobility is limited. You can only access corporate data from uh, devices that they've configured, issued to you, or VPN into the office. Uh, and it hinders both the user and the IT professional because there's high administrative overhead involved in managing and maintaining these uh, locks on every device. And of course, the usability is poor and, and the privacy is worse. Um, as I mentioned before, many people end up carrying multiple devices and worry about uh, what the company is doing with their personal life. So what do we do? Uh, we've taken a bold and ambitious approach, which is to say, to hell with the infrastructure, let's secure the data. Uh, sounds easier than, than it actually is to do, but that's, uh, that's what we do. So if you want us to secure data on your email system, on your Salesforce, or on whatever application you might want in the cloud or elsewhere, you let us sit in front of the application as a SaaS uh, pro uh, proxy or security device. The data flows through us, and the user can access the data from any network, any device, it doesn't really matter to us. And our job is to lock the data and only the data. So we don't try and restrain you from using this device or that device. You can go to your grandmother's house and log in and you still get your data. But the data is locked at, at, uh, at all times. It is a data that is uh, secure. And in our own personal lives, there is one such thing that we all use that is at least on paper uh, very secure. Uh, and yet everybody allows us to use it. And the dollar bill is one such thing that we all allow, are allowed to use it and encouraged to use it, in fact. But it's pretty hard to copy it without getting caught. Right? So think of that as our uh, inspiration, if you will, in terms of how to secure corporate data in a world where everybody has to access it, but nobody should be able to make unauthorized copies. So the net result of this is that the end user has unlimited mobility. You can use corporate data and access it from any device anywhere. Uh, there's low administrative overhead in the sense that there's no software to install anywhere. Uh, we're a completely SaaS-based service. And the usability is excellent. It's transparent. Uh, there's privacy in the sense that we're only in the way. We only secure data that belongs to the company. We're not sniffing on your personal email uh, accounts or uh, your, the phone bills, uh, phone calls you make to your, uh, to your family and, and friends. The advantage of doing it this way is that the IT person gets what they want, which is visibility, transfer, visibility, security, and, and compliance, and so on and so forth. And the user gets mobility, transparency, and privacy. The user gets to do what they want, where they want. Uh, they get transparency. They get to use their familiar user interface. And lastly, they get privacy. We don't touch your, your personal data. Traditional IT companies sell only the first piece because you sell to the IT buyer and you say, hey, I got all these things for you and the user is left out on the cold. And companies like that typically end up the way of the Blackberry where the user comes in and says, I got something better and I'm not gonna use that, that thing anymore. Right? I'm sure you all have favorite applications that the company forces down your throat and you just don't like to use it. So the short of it is that's what, that's what we do. Uh, secure corporate data in the cloud, on mobile, and anywhere. So I'm opening it up for questions from the judges, from anybody who wants to ask me uh, what we do. Questions, judges? 
how far along are you on customers, number of customers, how far, uh, how long have you been, yeah? We launched about uh, three months ago, and we have a fistful of customers. And in the security business, nobody likes to admit that they bought your product. Uh, that's one of our, our challenges. But the uh, two verticals where we get uh, most traction is healthcare is primary, and financial services is, uh, is number two. Healthcare is one area where uh, doctors want access to information anywhere and everywhere, patient information, and they don't want anything uh, hindering, uh, hindering them in that quest. And yet, the data has to be secured, so it's a particularly interesting, interesting area for us. Same question as before, what is your business model like? So, uh, we are a SaaS service, we charge per user per month, and we have various grades of the product uh, in terms of the, uh, the access model. Just by the mobile version, it's five bucks a user a month. If you buy mobile and, and browser laptops and so on, it's, it's higher. And then there's an enterprise edition, which is more where the salesperson haggles with the enterprise for all you can eat that week. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. All right, thank you. thank you. Judges, if you can please input your scores if you haven't done so already. And with that, I want to invite our next presenter up, Richard Dim, who is the CMO of Gaijin. Good, so first off, our story is much simpler. Um, Gaijin is in the business of helping salespeople sell more effectively by identifying when and why to call on a prospect. Um, interestingly, what we do on the outside is really simple. And I run sales and marketing, so I'll insult myself. Um, salespeople have, it's a very narrow focus. It's definitely do it for me today, and they don't care, they don't want to know about technology. What we do, though, is pretty complicated on the inside. And uh, Gagin was founded, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, 2009 by three PhDs in computer science. And um, the, the three founders spent roughly the last four years building the AI application, the English language processing, the machine learning, to do the background work. So how do we, how do we find and help these salespeople identify when and why to call on a prospect? We do it with what we call actionable news. Um, and to find this news, we crawl media sources, which are actually pretty easy, right? There's 17,000 public companies in the United States. They publish everything. Having said that, there are another 25 million companies in, in the US, uh, of which maybe 8 million have more than 10 employees. A lot of business there. In order to reach these companies, you can't depend on news to come from public sources. You have to be able to crawl websites. So in addition to literally crawling millions of sources to find the information, we focus on websites, and we really have built up a specialty in the SMB space. And the slides, uh, the slide up on the screen, yeah, it's a little bit of a brag slide. I would just say that um, uh, Gartner just picked us to be one of their cool digital marketing vendors. I only mention it because we began uh, promoting our products, and I'll talk about this in a second, uh, in November of last year, so we're very new. And we began selling a Salesforce product in February of this year, so again, very, very new. The other comment I'd make uh, about this slide, and it's probably kind of hard to see, um, it's great to have people saying nice things. These are all salespeople. Again, we sell and we provide a service to salespeople. Um, and uh, you can see from the variety of, a variety of companies, effectively, it's anybody, any salesperson who, who has the question, I'm always looking for a reason to connect or reconnect with a prospect. We give them that reason. So how do we do it? I've already said, it's an AI application. Um, and with that application, as I said, we not only look at public companies to find news that identifies these opportunities, but also small, small companies. Forrester, in January of this year, thank you, Forrester, put out a, a blog that, a, that claims that if you're the first salesperson, the first person to call on a prospect and help them understand what they want to do, you have a 74% chance of closing the deal. Conversely, if you don't do that, it's 26%. Um, obviously, near and dear to my heart, again, we help people with timing, when and why to call. So it's when, it's why, and the other thing that we do, and I kind of put it as an aside, uh, in addition to delivering this real-time news that identifies these opportunities, we aggregate a, a large amount of company, personnel, competitive, and social connection information. So effectively, we're doing the homework for the salesperson. Uh, the homework that every salesperson is supposed to do and either chooses not to, doesn't have the time, uh, I'll put it this way, how many people have gotten a phone call from a salesperson and the first thing they say is, oh, by the way, could you tell me about your company? I don't know how you feel about it, but I know I feel, bang, don't like it. So we give them a heads up, 
Now is the time to call on a prospect. Secondly, why do you want to call? And we do the homework for them. Now, I should say that I've, I've made the comment that we find actionable news. It isn't just a general search. Uh, we are doing trigger-based search. Um, it is not keyword search. It is context in, in context, so it's context-sensitive. Um, contextual, I should say. And uh, so that enables us to have a very high relevance in terms of the news that we provide. So uh, again, I feel kind of funny saying the power, the power of artificial intelligence. In fact, I almost smile when uh, I say it. If you go back, I'm old enough to say go back to the 90s, AI was kind of a hot topic. Then it got really quiet. Uh, AI is hot again. I mean, there's a bidding war going on right now for AI people. Um, if you look at the scale of what we have, we're covering millions of sources for news. Again, not just media sources, but it's millions because we're crawling, crawling websites and blogs. Uh, secondly, we're providing coverage for over two million companies. So it's an extremely comprehensive database growing every day. And in fact, what Gagin does, if, we, if you are looking for a company that we don't currently follow them, we add them on demand. And uh, as you would expect then, our database grows really dynamically. And interestingly, whether it's governments, whether it's, uh, it's healthcare, whether it's education, a wide variety of folks using it. Um, we, uh, we are used by employees at over 6,000 companies. I say already, uh, we just began, uh, we just made the product available in October. Uh, and I'll talk about the business model in a second around that. Uh, and uh, the last bullet point, is kind of interesting, that 94% of the companies that are followed are small companies. Kind of not a surprise, but when you're providing a service to individual salespeople, it's who they sell to. Uh, so from a product perspective, which ties into what we deliver, uh, number one, it's the whole idea is delivering news to salespeople whenever and where, whenever, where, whenever and wherever it's needed. And we have adopted a mobile-first strategy, which simply means we're building for mobile, um, uh, both uh, both phones and personally, I think uh, tablets and iPads uh, are, are the market. But having said that, also for the web, um, and probably most importantly for Salesforce. And I say most importantly because this goes to the heart of our business model, our web version and our, uh, our mobile versions are all free. And what we're doing on that side is we're building a large community of users taking advantage of this information, a community of salespeople. That's who we're selling to. And to put it in perspective, um, uh, Oracle has almost 600 people using Gagin now, free product. Um, uh, ADP, probably 400. Uh, Accenture uh, has, I think, 300. Uh, this is word of mouth growth. And a strategy supporting that is absolutely word of mouth. Uh, so we work very hard to encourage sales folks to share, and candidly, that works the best inside the company. Okay, um, Salesforce, we began shipping Gagin for Salesforce in February. Um, that is a subscription-based product. Um, it does everything our web version does inside of Salesforce, and then it's tailored to the Salesforce world. So it also enables you to, to work with opportunities, with leads, uh, with contacts, uh, and with accounts, so you can interface with chatter, you can create tasks and post them. Um, for a large company, uh, it's, it's a way of, excuse me, bringing engagement into your, into your core systems. And by the way, from a strategic perspective, by building that base of free users, that becomes an entree for us to move into that enterprise world. Hello, Mr. Vice President of Sales. Did you know you have 300 people using Gagin? Let's talk about bringing that usage now into one of your core systems where you begin to control. So on the free side, it's individuals. On the Salesforce side, we're selling to sales management. Okay. Um, the, um, so this is, this is my, my final slide. And I couldn't resist uh, putting the judging criteria right there. So from, a, from an innovative perspective, uh, as I said, we've spent four years building the what we call smart track technology, which is AI-based. And that's what enables us to find this actionable news, uh, enables us to find it in websites and in blogs, which, by the way, Google doesn't do. And Google's not doing trigger-based search. Uh, secondly, from a, from marketing impact, I wasn't sure how to handle this except to say, I only hope we do as well as Gartner, I'm sorry, as Forrester, um, as, as they believe. Our goal is to help salespeople close 74% of their business. I don't know if it's 74% or 70%. That would be a killer number if that's true. That's our goal. Uh, and from a scalability perspective, we are covering you know, millions, millions of companies. 
Uh, we're working with, you know, with hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, uh, of uh, I'm sorry, tens of thousands of users today uh, with a system that's scaling uh, dramatically. And as I mentioned, uh, if we don't cover a company that you're interested in, we have the company for you. Um, so uh, that's, that enables us not only to satisfy more sales folks in different industries, but also grows our installed base. Uh, and then from a go-to-market from a go-to-market perspective, as I said, we're building a large user community with our free product. It's fairly traditional, and uh, however, you know what? Just because it's free doesn't mean people will use it. Not in the B2B space. It's very different than B2C, right? So we're building that world, and we use that to leverage into our paid world. In addition, that user community that we're building represents a tremendous asset down the road. We can sell on top of it. We can choose to sell. Uh, we can we can choose to price uh, and sell it for a price. Uh, and as I say, we also use it then to, um, uh, to sell into the Salesforce uh, community. And then finally, I'd just say that um, what we've been calling ourselves is Google Alerts on steroids. And uh, uh, for our target market, for salespeople, when we say Google Alerts on steroids, they get it. And it's one sentence, and they get what we do. So that's what Cajun's all about. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> Any questions from the judges? Yeah, I've seen I've seen challenges in the past with sort of the reasoning around converting from that free service to something that companies are paying for, you know, and could you expand a little bit on that beyond what you've already said about sort of how you would sort of explain why it would make sense for an enterprise yeah, to start it, paying for the product? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, uh, and in case anybody didn't hear it, the question was basically how do you how do you convert from free yeah. uh, into a paying product? And uh, the uh, interestingly, Salesforce, and that's the only CRM system we're working with today. Uh, actually, Oracle built a proof of concept. Um, uh, no salesperson wants Salesforce. Uh, sales management wants Salesforce. So we're selling to sales management, and why do they? Why are they willing to spend money when there's a free product out there? Because they can manage it. They can see what their what their users are, what their salespeople are looking at, what they're following up on. Candidly, all the things the salespeople don't want, but that's what sales management does. Uh, and then, uh, but I also want to point. I really want to point out that um, I also view the uh, the free base as potentially even more valuable than Salesforce base. Uh, it's obviously it's for us. It's growing much more rapidly, and you know we just have a lot of options. Five dollars per month per user. All of a sudden, with you know when you have tens of thousands of users, begins to add up very nicely. Great. Any other questions? Any other questions? Can you tell us a little bit about the underlying technology that you're talking about? Because it sounds pretty magical right now. But maybe if you can demystify it a little bit, that, that might help address yeah, the scalability question. Uh, I'm smiling because this is, I was going to say, hey, I'm a marketing guy, man. That's, um, um, uh, so uh, I guess the, the key points are of the technology. Um, uh, it is model-based. Uh, in fact, the first presenter talked about training a system, and, uh, and you know, and as I said, by the way, salespeople keep it simple. Underneath the cover is complicated. So um, it's a uh, it's a learning system, uh, and as far as sales triggers are concerned, we have to teach it so it understands the the uh, the, the contextual meaning of a sales trigger. Uh, secondly, um, um, it's um, uh, uh, we we bec not only focus that on public sources, but also then use that, that English language processing to literally read, to be able to read the uh, read websites. And again, that's where the contextual part of it's so important, right? Because, you know, Apple, I mean, you guys know, right? I mean, if you search for Apple, you might get a Macintosh. Uh, but if you're searching for Apple in context, you get the computer. Um, and uh, I guess the, the third thing I would say that, uh, and this goes back again to the key being contextual versus keyword. So it's not a simple rule-based system. It is more complex. I'm sorry. You know, more than that, that's what we have the PhDs and the stuff. Uh, uh, but I will tell you this much, that the salespeople don't care, uh, which is the wonderful thing about it, right? I mean, what they care about is they get a steady stream of this news. In fact, I remiss to say, think of it as radar. That's how I pitch it, right? It's a radar system for them. Follow as many companies as possible, and you'll have a steady stream of what we call high-value prospects coming in. Why high-value? Something's happened that's meaningful to you from a sales tribute. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Judges, if you could put your scores in. And while you're doing that, if we could welcome our next presenter up here, France Lucelle, who's the CEO of Sumo Logic. All 
All right, let's roll. We're good. Good. Hey, thank you for having me, Vance Loisel. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. So I'm the CEO of Sumo Logic. Uh, really quickly, we turn machine data into operational intelligence. And we focus primarily on IT operations and security. And if you look at why we do that, there's 5.2 million petabytes of unstructured data out there for enterprises to analyze. And it's growing five times faster than human-generated data. And somebody has to solve the problem, and we do it. Uh, if you look at us, we started in 2010. The reason we started the company, uh, our two founders came from a company called ArcSight in the security uh, event management space. And fundamentally, that approach was flawed. And the reason that approach was flawed is the data was growing too fast. It was done on premise and it couldn't scale. And it made an assumption that you had to understand what the data looked like in order to properly analyze it. Uh, and we basically took a fundamentally different approach, moved it to the cloud, and put some machine learning on top of it. And obviously that's a topic that you've heard a lot of today. Um, just to give you a little background, so we're a little further along. We've had, we just announced our fourth round of funding. Uh, Sequoia led the round, so we announced it yesterday. We raised 30 more million. We have 80 million in funding so far to date. Uh, and we have a fair amount of traction. We have about 110 employees, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So why is this space so big? If you take a look at you know, what traditionally IT and security organizations have been looking at, they've been looking at one block of data. They've been looking at data on the network and data on the servers. And fundamentally, over the last, call it five years, there's been an explosion of smartphones. right? And those smartphones have driven a lot of mobile traffic. They've also driven an explosion in applications. And they've driven an explosion in the underlying application infrastructure required to manage that stuff. And so here's you know, four examples. Three of them are large customers of ours. But you know, Netflix, relatively new company, they have over 20 terabytes a day of unstructured data. IBM, everybody knows IBM, they probably have between 100 and 300 terabytes a day of unstructured data. And you know, Ring Central, pretty new company, just went public. They have over 10 terabytes a day of data on one application. Right? So the ability to understand what's happening in that data, find security breaches, find problems in your infrastructure, you know, is critical. You know, one jet airplane for United or Delta generates 40 terabytes an hour from the engines, the cockpit, so on and so forth, right? Somebody has to figure out how to harness that information. What do we do? We take that data, we collect it. We have this little nerdy collector that sits on premise or in your cloud. We run about 40,000 collectors today across the, across, across the world. We compress the data, we encrypt it, and we have a caching mechanism, and then we just send it to this massively scalable cloud index that we have. We run it in about 14 data centers right now, and that index basically indexes the data and figures out you know, how to basically put it in a mechanism that you can search it, you can visualize it in real time with dashboards, and more importantly, you have a prediction engine. You sit it on top of the data, we baseline the signatures that actually generated the data, and we can figure out every couple of minutes what's varying from the baseline to find anomalies in the patterns. So a potential anomaly is somebody had you know, three failed logins followed by a successful login followed by a deletion of files. That's a potential breach. You can see a burst in certain data traffic. That could be a potential, potential denial of service attack. You can see a drop off you know, in your web activity and a burst in, you know, a ACL permission changes, you know, to get nerdy. That could be something wrong with a port on your firewall causing your application to be down. These are all examples that come from our customers today. So, just to give you some sense on our growth, you know, we basically launched the service when I got there in May of 2012. Uh, we raised our C round about 15 months ago. If you look today, we index somewhere between 15 and 20 terabytes a day. We have over two petabytes of live data in our index that people search. Uh, and more importantly, the harder problem is we run over five million queries a month, and a query is an unbounded problem. Think about Oracle, in the cloud, unlimited usage. A query could be as simple as find me an error over the last 15 minutes, or it could be as complex as search the last year on the number of shopping carts that have been aban abandoned, time slice by minute, you know, by retail location, right? all based on the query language and engine that we have under the covers. Uh, we have about 300 customers today, just to give you a sense. We try to focus on three primary verticals, verticals that have a lot of data and have an appetite for cloud. Uh, we focus on media and gaming, hence the Netflixes, the Grease, the Supercells of the world. 
Uh, we focus on e-commerce and e-tail, like a lot of data, obviously, if you look at the clickstream exhaust coming from those applications. And then obviously we focus on tech. That being said, probably 30% of our business comes outside of those industries because everybody has data and everybody's trying to figure out how to do it. We just qualify whether they have an appetite to do cloud. Um, give you an idea, just in the last year, we've you know, grown our bookings over 500%. We've grown our customers. I think we were roughly at about 100 customers a year ago or at over 300 right now. Uh, and I mentioned how much volume is currently crunching through the system. Fundamentally, you know, we compete against one company, and you've probably heard of it if you follow the press, a company called Splunk, or Splunk's really only competitor right now, uh, though others would argue they are as well. Uh, the reality is we have four fundamental things that we do that makes it different. It's an elastic cloud, so it's massively scalable. Second thing is because it's elastic, we provide a query performance guarantee. We make sure you have consistent performance all the time. That's a very hard thing to do with queries. The third thing, it all falls under this machine learning bucket. We have an anomaly detection engine that uses machine learning. You can educate it and it'll find anomalies and you can basically categorize those anomalies. And the last thing that we do, which is something new, is we basically have a collaborative analytics fabric. So when you're a user and our thousands of users across the globe and hundreds of companies, if you find a problem and you wanna share that, you have the ability to share not your data, but insights and the metadata about what this problem is. So you can kind of aggregate. And our goal long term is to basically create the early warning system across the globe. You plug in and you will light up like you would a Netflix account and say, here's what the recommended best practices, here are the security breaches occurring across the globe. You don't necessarily have to know who's incurring those, but you can use the signatures to identify those in your own environment. And it'll fun fundamentally change how organizations do manage infrastructure, manage security, manage applications. That's it. Everybody can go have drinks now. Thank ah. you. Well, first, are there any... Are there any questions from the judges? Just a quick one on business model. Yes. How do you make your money? How do we, how much money or how no, do we How make do you that? make your money? We don't make enough, but we're working on it. How, how do we make our money? So we basically have a bifurcated model. We have a freemium model that our inside sales organization qualifies, and they basically take those freemium so you can use up to a half a, half a gigabyte a day in data, try some use cases out. Our inside sales organization targets customers under a billion in revenue and then qualifies those and turns those into opportunities. Um, and then we have an enterprise sales organization primarily focused in North America. They focus on enterprises greater than a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, and we just hired this announcement we did yesterday with our funding. We just hired some people in Europe and, and Asia PAC. Uh, but they go after classic large enterprises with lots of data. Does that, that answer your question? Okay, yeah, you great. mentioned yeah. that you can query some of the historical data. Yes. Given that you have a variety of data uh, sources, for example, the jet engine data is very different from your log data. Do you have a common query language that allow you to support a variety of different yeah, data if, types? Yeah, if I understand your question, the, the data is varied. How does our query language deal with all that different data and, and normalize it and all that? Is that the question? Uh, so. Basically think about, because we index the data, so think about Google 10 years ago. It basically had to take static web pages, index it, and then you could search it. Well, what we have to do is we basically take data that gets spit out of log files and API files, yeah. we index it in real time, which is actually a much harder problem, yeah. and then we create a query language, which is a combination of, think of, you know, SQL, if you've ever done SQL coding, merged with something, you know, like a Unix syntax like Bash, you merge those together and you can do very flexible things around, you know, select this, sort by this, where this equals this, sum, average, min, max, standard deviation, you know, and then you get very simple results back or you can get complex kind of, we call it a schema on read, but it's like an Excel pivot table on steroids and then you can turn that into graphs and visualizations and so on. Um, but the fundamental, you know, core IP besides the cloud and machine learning is the indexing capability. If you can index it in real time, then you can search it with our language. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a lot of question I have. Yeah. Yeah. You already deal with a very large volume of data. I think the data you know, is going to get even bigger. How scalable is it? You know, doing the. Index I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Um, so, how scalable is the in, the, your indexing approach? Yeah, how how scalable is it? It's pretty darn scalable. I mean, it's a hard problem to solve in the cloud, but we, uh, you know, we've basically increased, so we're at roughly 18 terabytes a day in real time. That equates to about 40 billion records a day. And then there's probably on average, you know, 400 fields per record, so you can do the math. And we are increasing the size of that index by, you know, an extra terabyte a day every month, right? So it's growing at that scale, and, uh, you know, you saw the chart of how fast it's growing. Does that make sense? 
Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Thank you for being thank patient. You. Thank Let's you. Let's drink. Thank you. Judges, the winner of the Beyond Cloud Challenge is Sumo Logic. Thank you. Likewise. I appreciate it. Great. Appreciate the Great. opportunity. Yeah. I was going to throw one that I